Do I have a small room? All right, well. Um, wait, wait 30 seconds so some people can. Okay, everyone can settle. Well, I can tell you that I. Yeah? 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 <laughs> um, my confession is that this is my first PowerPoint presentation ever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Although I am a communications officer. All our groups who are here tonight can attest. Um, it's nothing I've been able to do during my interview process. But, uh, so I'm really excited. Um, all right, so tonight I'm going to talk about um, why bad writing happens to good people like us. And um, the reason why I decided to talk about it is I was actually going to talk about something else altogether. I was going to talk about surrogate motherhood in India. And then I was beginning to chat with Amanda, um, who I have to thank for inviting me here. And also I want to thank Matt and everybody in the house and, and Xander. Um, but, and then I, I just began complaining about my job. And it wasn't the wonderful people. It wasn't my wonderful boss. And it wasn't even the writing that other people were doing at the job. It was the writing that I was doing. It was suddenly turning into complete shit. And just for background, I went to Columbia for, for three years in the master's program. I got my MFA in creative nonfiction. Um, I taught composition to four sad freshmen for, for two years. Um, and so I felt as though I should be able to write well, no matter what the context was. I felt that I had certain values as a writer. And I felt like I was not living those values every day when I began to write things like this. <coughs> now, these are words that I swore I would never use. <laughs> <laughs> Until I entered the workplace uh, three months ago. <laughs> Very 
questionnaire. I have no idea who this person is who wrote this work. And I think that doesn't sound all that impressive. I wouldn't, I'm hiring an intern right now, and I, I don't think I would hire a person who wrote a sentence like that. Um, yeah. Let's go look at a few more. <coughs> this is an example of technical writing. I think it can be very hard to write. Um, you have to explain a field that people might be unfamiliar with. And so, can somebody please read this technical specimen? Thanks, Justin. While HDDs can store hundreds of GB, SSDs <laughs> capacity are smaller. The cost per megabyte is higher for solid state storage devices than for electromechanical drives. However, the price of IOPS is much lower for SSDs. Does anyone here understand what that means? <laughs> <laughs>
or that you could exclude a word and therefore exclude the concept. So the word freedom was illegal in these speak. So people didn't know what it meant to be free. And they used something called double speak, which was they would call something the exact opposite of what it was to disguise the meaning and to confuse people into thinking that what was bad was good, what was good was bad. So Winston, who's the very sad um, hero of the book, is tortured in the ministry. <coughs> and it's really fascinating to see what happens you know, when, when reality is, is warped kind of through the, the language in the newspapers and the constructed histories. So I'll stop myself there about 1984 um, and talk a little bit about politics and the English language, which I think, if anything, is a more interesting essay, because in it, um, Orwell is writing about real-life England in 1946. So just after this war, with these, you know, we have Stalin, this horrible communist. Orwell is completely disillusioned with him. He's disillusioned, obviously, never liked fascism. But he's really most disturbed by the writing that's going on at home. So he wrote an essay where he examined specimens, just as, as we've done here, um, from the newspaper, from a political pamphlet, um, from letters to the editor. And he finds that there's a real decline in the way people are writing and using English. And most of all, he's finding language that is exactly like the kind of language I see in the business place every day. And I don't really think that we actually see in our political world, any, world anymore. You know, we, we live in a folksy political world of Sarah Palin, and where even Obama has to say folks, right? He can't say people. We're not using these kind of complicated words, but in Orwell's time, they were. And to give an example of the degradation and, and what it's doing to the language, he translated a verse from Ecclesiastes from the St. James Bible. Um, into modern English. And I think that this really um, supports my feeling of feeling guilty when I think about Orwell and I think about the kind of writing I'm doing, because he really thought it was morally wrong. It wasn't just an aesthetic judgment. It wasn't just that he thought that this kind of writing worked better, although he did. He thought that this was bad. So can I ask someone to read the, the Bible passage? I returned and saw and the sun that the race is not the swift, though the battle is strong. Neither yet the red, the wide. Nor yet riches to man of understanding, nor yet favor to man of skill, for time and chance hath it them all. Okay, and who wants to read the modern <coughs> English? Oh, thank you. Objective considerations of contemporary phenomena compel the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must invariably be taken into account. <laughs> and the scary thing is, if you look at these two passages, if you really look at them, they actually, the second paragraph does paraphrase the first. It has the same meaning. But what's one thing that you guys think is missing? Imagery. Imagery, exactly. Mm. Is there anything else? Soul. Soul, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, right. Soul right. It. I mean, that seems like a sun is a symbol. Yeah. Well, specifics. Specifics are gone. Imagery is gone. And it sounds... A lyrical flow. Mm -hmm. No flow. Mm -hmm. A lyrical... Right. Lyricism. Lyricism is gone. There's no voice to it, right? It sounds like anybody could have written that. Mm -hmm. um, and... Sorry, I want to read my quote. So, you know, why does this happen? So Orville is describing this kind of language, and he, he has names for certain kinds of phenomena we see here. For Orwell, um, modern English had kind of you know, like about four or five main characteristics. One of them was really stale imagery when you use imagery at all. Meaningless words like impact, you know, <laughs> or like um, facilitate, worn out metaphors. Um, oh, where's that? And then something he called operators or verbal false links. So he says instead of using simple kind of Saxon verbs, people use kind of complicated Latin constructions to sound smart, um, such as render and operative. And he says these save the trouble of picking out appropriate verbs and nouns and at the same time pad each sentence with extra syllables, which give it an appearance of symmetry. Char characteristic phrases are render and operative, debilitate against, make contact with, be subjected to, give rise to, give grounds to, have the effect of, play the breathing part in, make itself felt, take effect, exhibit a tendency to, serve the purpose of. And actually, Rebecca and I were talking about this passage, and we realized we both use this language all the time. Um, Rebecca's in development, and I'm in communication. This is what happens. 